Good morning, everyone. Our global ecosystem is an intrigued design that we are yet to completely understand. Biodiversity is one of the many of our world. I thought if we pollute the air, water, and soil that keep us alive and well, and destroy the biodiversity that allow natural to function, no amount of money will save us. Unquote. There will be. On behalf of New Law College, Bharti Vidya Peeth Dean to be University. Welcome, Dr. Arish Burucha, Director, Institute of Environment Education and Research at Bharti Vidya Peet University, Pune. And also to welcome Mahishri Deshpande, Madam, Principal, New Law College, Pune. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce our guest. A surgeon by profession, he has been at the field of wildlife and nature conservation over the past 50 years. A well-known wildlife photographer, Sir has started Indian National Park and wildlife extensively. Sir is the member of National Tiger Conservation Authority, Chairman, Maharashtra State Biodiversity Board, Member of Wildlife Advisory Board, Maharashtra State. Sir has authored five books and 66 articles published in international and national journals. Now I request Sir to address the attendees. Thank you very much, uh, Madam, and thank you, our new law college, for inviting me for this webinar. And I think it's a very important topic that you have selected because it deals not only with law, but with a whole lot of other people who have to get become part of this understanding of what is the Biodiversity Act and actually what is biodiversity. Uh, if we have to understand what is biodiversity, then we have to first also look at whose resource is it. So this is something that I feel uh, needs to be uh, brought into public domain. May I have the slide, first slide, please? Uh, if we look at uh, the biodiversity conservation, in today's day and age, it means that we have, have, to, have to have some law to protect it. And this is what the uh, way in which we are trying to do this today is different from just a few years ago. Conservation in its traditional sense, we always thought of as being there in national parks and sanctuaries of what we today refer to as protected areas. But we now realize that a lot of the biodiversity that we have to deal with and which we use is outside national parks and sanctuaries. It's in our agricultural land, it's in our forest areas, it's in uh, the cultural landscapes that we have, it is even in urban areas. And this is what these two books actually uh, talk about in terms of land use. And that is something that legally we have to understand very clearly and understand the cultural attributes that are there for biodiversity and biodiversity conservation. May I have the next slide, Anwar? <clears throat> if you look at biodiversity, biodiversity is not spread equally around the world. It is there in certain areas of the tropics much more prominently, both in the terrestrial ecosystem on land as well as in the sea. And so we have South Asia, which is part, most part of it is India, Southeast Asia and South American countries which are, which are most rich in biological diversity. And these we can refer to as hot spots of biodiversity, but even within them, within each country, there are hot specks of biodiversity. And today we refer to this as other effective area-based conservation measures. This is a very new concept. And the idea that we can only have this in large national parks and sanctuaries has changed to even identifying smaller areas like sacred groves and ponds and, and mountains and rivers. <clears throat> so <clears throat> when we were talking about conservation in the past, we always thought of building a sort of wall around protected areas and trying to protect that biodiversity within it. Today we find that this is just not going to be possible. We also realize that biodiversity is something that belongs to everybody. And therefore, we have to take local people into confidence in trying to use it at a sustainable level. Next, please. So to do this, 
we have to look at how this has progressed over year, over many many generations of humanity i think in india observation is not new it's been there from the vedic times and uh, we have had our sacred animals and sacred plants and whatever you do. buddha and mahavir preached in the 6th century bc about the sanctity of all forms of life and you had a great emperor emperor ashoka who in the 3rd century bc created edicts in which he said these particular animals will not be brought onto my table onto my dining table now this predates what we today refer to as international union of conservation of nature's scheduled species which we are supposed to very carefully protect so we know this from ages and ages we also had elephant reserves elephants were meant for elephants were meant as war machines so we protected them in elephant reserves the rajput rulers had large shooting reserves which they maintained for themselves and today we find that 50 of our major protected areas and tiger reserves were originally shooting reserves of the maharajas come to the 16th uh, 1600s and we have the moguls and the moguls uh, were very fascinated with india's wildlife and so they had persian artists to come to india and paint our animals birds and plants and uh, jangir was probably the first naturalist that our country ever produced who really documented a lot of our wildlife then comes the british period and the imperialist british period where every administrator was expected to shoot a tiger because then that was a symbol that he was one powerful dada you know in the, in the country and so you had administrators and forest officers and police people going out and doing shikar very oddly the same british fellows who were shooting large numbers of animals in india became conservationists when they realized that the game that they were shooting was disappearing and this is something that they therefore started as a small conservation movement the first such movement occurs in the mid 1800s which was the bombay natural history society it was a it was a society of uh, just uh, some business people and they were interested in shikar and when they couldn't found that their shikar was disappearing they set up a natural history society which collected a lot of information they also set up the first protected areas they helped government of british government of course create protected areas national parks and uh, today from the beginnings of those two national parks we have more we, we have more than 800 national parks and sanctuaries in the country so next please anwar so if you look at what are our present present concerns and i think today's talk will really focus on four specific points we will look at what is biodiversity we'll look at what is this international convention on biological diversity and how it came about we will talk about what is the biological diversity act that india created in 2002 and we will look at what do we as citizens of this country uh, have to do for uh, conservation of biodiversity in future so these are the four points i think that we will try to cover in this brief lecture next so to understand what is biodiversity i think we have to begin at the beginning and uh, some 3.8 billion years ago the earth was cooling down it had developed seas and somewhere in this brackish water of the sea a very special event took place life was born and this took place 3.8 billion years ago and the earliest life forms were probably very much like the covid virus that has hit us today but it is also very much that you had algal forms and you had zooplankton or small animal forms microscopic animal forms that fed on this vegetable matter of the algae so you developed the first what we refer to as the food chain next please so this was the beginnings of life but if you look at biodiversity in a more holistic way then you have three 
big domains of biodiversity. The first is what we are very familiar with wildlife, right? Flora, fauna, wild uh, species, and so on. But the second is that each of these species cannot survive on its own. And therefore, you have food chains and food pyramids <clears throat> which join all these species together in ecosystems. So ecosystems is the other domain <clears throat> of biological diversity. This is both found in nature as natural biodiversity, but it's also, also found in what humans have developed out of this. And this is what we refer to as cultural landscapes. So our agricultural bells, our grazing lands, our plantation forestry and so on, which are all human related cultural landscapes. Now, for every species, there has to be a genetic diversity. And therefore, there are genes as a third level, which is there in huge diverse forms in every species on earth, right? So these three domains are very closely, as you see in this diagram, very closely interlinked. Uh, none of these three can exist by themselves. They have to be all three together integrally, and they are constantly every day, 24 by seven, interacting with each other. Next, please. So let's look at species diversity very briefly. It's plants, animals, fungi, microorganisms. So it's all flora and fauna, which is found all over the world today. And you can see this diversity of life in the wild species. This is both on land as well as in, in the water, as well as in the sea. Species diversity in the wild is now extremely threatened because we have reduced wilderness areas very grossly. And more or less different countries have different amounts of wilderness area. India would have about 7 8%. So this is too little for all the species that are there at the, at the global level, as well as at our national level, of course. Next. So next, please. If you look at then domesticated diversity, which is found in our crops and which is found in our livestock breeds. Somewhere, uh, probably around Bibetka, which is in the central highlands of India, humans started growing crops for the first time. And when they grew these crops, they found that different crops grew differently. And so as humanity expanded across India, they found different, different crops growing in different areas. So you had rice growing areas and wheat growing areas and milk growing areas, especially in the arid lands. But you also had animal husbandry. And so we had cattle, sheep, goats of different varieties of different breeds, which is a very important part of our traditional knowledge systems in our country. Now this is actually linked to the third domain of biodiversity which is, next please, which is the whole of ecosystem diversity, which needs food chains and food pyramids. Diversity provides us with all our life support systems. It gives us food security, but very importantly, what is very often we forget about, it gives us ecosystem services. So it is biodiversity, which gives us cleaner air, water, the whole, uh, services that uh, are pollinators, seed dispersal, all these things on which human life depends are all part of ecosystem services, which is very much linked to both natural and cultural landscapes. Next, please. So all this leads us into the third domain, which is genetic diversity. Of course, it is found in enormous variations in every species. It is used for creating food. It is used in our medicines. It's used now more and more for biotechnology. And it is very important in India to realize that all those different communities that you see in this picture, all have had huge amount of traditional knowledge about biodiversity within their own areas. This is something that India is very special in. We have this enormous traditional knowledge systems about plants and animals, 
in all sorts of communities, but very specially in our tribal communities today. Next, please. So let's look at it globally. If you look at species diversity globally, you find something very interesting. Firstly, we believe that we have got 1.9 million known species, which scientists have given names to. But many scientists believe that this figure could be 20 to 50 times higher. So global biodiversity is enormous, right? And therefore, we need to understand where is all this global biodiversity in terms of species. And the first thing that we look at in this pie diagram is this brown sector that you have there, which is insect diversity. They are pollinators, they are seed, seed dispersers, they are in the detritus, in the forests, in grasslands, in wetlands, which is in the dead material that uh, has to be recycled as nutrients. So all this insect life constitutes 52% of species in the world. The other big sector, 17% uh, is that green sector that you see, which is our flowering plants, from which all our food crops have been developed and from which we get gardens and from which we get forests and from which we have this enormous vegetation diversity in flowering plants. But look at some of these others, that pink one, which is arthropods and minor invertebrates. That is expanding very rapidly because we are discovering new ones all the time. And also look at that small light blue line, which you have right at the top there, which is mammals. 0.29% of all species are in this small sector of mammals, yellow one. Now mammals have got one very special species and that is human beings. So you can imagine among all those mammals, there is this one special creature which manages today all the biodiversity in the world. And if you manage it carefully, you will have sustainable management of this. And if we as human beings start destroying it, we will of course destroy ourselves. Now, around in the world, we said, there are some global hotspots, which are South America, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and the islands across the world. These are areas which we now refer to as hotspots. Next slide, please. So we also need to look therefore in detail about India's biodiversity and its species richness. India is now known as a mega diversity nation. And that is because it has 8% of the world's diversity in only 2.4% of the world's land. This is what makes us very special. But there is one more thing that makes us very special. Of course, you all will all love to see this tiger in this slide and say, wow, that's a very beautiful tiger. But there is also this beautiful atlas moth in India, which is the second largest moth in India. Equally precious, but we hardly ever think about these what we call cryptic species or hidden species. And many of these species are either endemic, which means found only in India, and also endangered, which means they are highly threatened by extinction due to human activities. So the species richness in India which is so very special, can be looked at in this next slide, where you see, next slide onward, yeah, where you see the range of species in the world and the range of species in India in the second column and the share that we have for global species diversity. So in some places we are very special. Look at the fish diversity. Fish diversity, we are 9.4% of the world's fish uh, species that we have. Birds, we have 13.66% of world's avifauna, bird life. But look at this, very special. Plants, we have nearly 10% of plants in the world from which all foods and medicine has to come. So we have a lot of variation in our country, but a lot of it is threatened and a lot of it is found only in our country. Next, please. So if you look at endemism, which is species of plants and animals found nowhere else in the earth, India is very high. But India also, we are not equally rich in species across the country. 
And so we were trying to identify in the 1970s and 80s, where are India's hotspots? So we knew that India is a global hotspot, but in India, what was the hottest areas? And so there were two scientists called Rogers and Pawar from the Wildlife Institute of India, who in 1988 were given this enormous task of trying to create biogeographic zones for India. And so they have identified from the biology as well as the geography and climate, which are the richest areas in the country. And so you find that the 10 biogeographic zones are trans Himalayas, which is Ladakh, which we are trying to fight for just now. Himalayas, the Gadgetic Plains of India, which were our food goal, the desert, semi-arid lands where all our, our, our millets and baja and jawar were grown, the Deccan Peninsula, very importantly, the Western Ghats, and equally importantly, the Northeast states of India and our islands, these become the richest hotspots of India uh, uh, today. So next slide, please. So why do we have to preserve biodiversity? The first is that we have a global responsibility of preserving the Earth's resources. But the next part of it, which uh, we frequently understand very easily, is the economic dimension. From all these plants especially, we have pharmaceutical products, we have medicines, we have cosmetics, which all you ladies use very liberally today. Uh, all our industrial products must have some source in nature. Then the second part is the life support that our forager communities collect, people who collect plants and animals from the wild. These communities, for them, this is the only life support system. Then we have supporting ecosystem services, as I mentioned earlier. This is really cannot be quantified in economic terms. They are, they, it is just enormous. Right? So this is something that uh, uh, we have to actually look at. Uh, supporting natural and cultural diversity can only be done if we take these resources at sustainable levels. And sustainable levels really means that we take out only what the system can reproduce easily. So this is about why we should preserve this biodiversity. Next, please. Next, please. So to do this, what happened around the 1990s was that the world started understanding that much of this biodiversity is going to disappear. And so they said, we need to get together and find ways to protect biological diversity. And so in the Rio conference in 1992, nations got together and said, how do we preserve this biodiversity? America wrote the first biodiversity convention and said that this should be considered a global resource. And the countries that were rich in biodiversity got up and said, no, why should it be a global resource? This is our asset. This is, this is mine. And why can you think of it as a global resource? You can't just take away my biodiversity, right? And so the whole act, the whole convention was rewritten so that Biodiversity is now considered a sovereign resource. I'm sure as lawyers, you understand this. It means that whatever biodiversity India has belongs to India and nobody can take it away for free. So this is exploiting our resource by an outside agency was completely stopped by creating this convention on biological diversity. So we also have that responsibility then as India to look at sustainable levels at which we can actually use this biodiversity for biotechnology, for growing new crops, for growing biodiversity gets into everything now, industry and so on. So the historical background of this, which started from 1992, it took us 10 years to make our own convention on biological diversity become what is the next thing our Biodiversity Act. Next, please. Next slide. So the Biological Diversity Act of India is really probably one of the best biodiversity acts the world has ever written. And 
This act, therefore, that came out in 2002 and became operational by 2003, talks about conservation of biodiversity, but also its sustainable use. So whereas our earlier laws with wildlife and all said protect wildlife, today we were saying, yes, we have to protect it and conserve it, but we also need to use it sustainably. To do this, India has a National Biodiversity Authority in Chennai, and we have written a National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan in 2008, which is now being redone, uh, to comply with the Convention on Biological Diversity. So that is the genesis of our act. Next, please. How do we implement this? So to implement this, there is a National Biodiversity Authority, which is an advisory body to all state biodiversity boards. And the state biodiversity boards, therefore, have a responsibility to conserve the biodiversity in every state in India. This is both in rural areas as well as in urban areas. And so our act has something very special which other acts don't have, that we have biodiversity management committees at the local level, at the village level, at the, at the uh, urban level, we have biodiversity management committees. So this is part of our Panchayat Raj system. And therefore, it is something that shows that every individual has a right to biodiversity use, okay? But it has to be used at sustainable levels. This requires also an appropriate state level strategy and action plan. Uh, Maharashtra state level and action plan has been done by Bharti Vidya Pit Environment Institute. So this is something that we have been able to achieve as one of the first states to write a very comprehensive state level strategy and action plan. Next, please. So if you look at both the linkages between the international and the national biodiversity obligations that we have, then we have to look at several things. We have to look at the National Biodiversity Action Plan, which has been drawn from the Convention on Biological Diversity of 1993, which is international. It has India's Biological Diversity Act of 2002. It has the National Biodiversity Action Plan 2014. But it has a very old tradition in the National Environment Policy of India and also in our, in our uh, various things that we actually passed in terms of pollution laws and so on. But this is something that has is be, been given to us as a right. International obligations also take a place, place in this. One is Aichi targets. Aichi targets deal specifically with biodiversity, whereas sustainable development goals deal with uh, all the other goals of uh, environment management. Next, please. So, next please. So what is the background of the National Biodiversity Action Plan? See, in this case, again, we are very special. We have brought this down to the village level. And therefore our strategy and action plan deals with all that you see in those slides there about resources that are collected from nature, about the agricultural land and how we manage it, how we grow our agriculture, and how we have managed to save traditional crops. For example, India has 30 to 50, once had 30 to 50 varieties of rice itself, all growing through this traditional knowledge system that you see here in these slides. Next, please. The NBAP, the National Biodiversity Action Plan, has 178 targets, okay? There are 12 action points and this uh, we are rewriting that just now in the Ministry of Environment and Forest. And this includes conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. It is also linked to many other, many other ministries. So it is meant to protecting endangered species and threatened species and so on. But not just the species that you see in, this, in these three pictures, which are a major species of Maharashtra, the bustard is great Indian bustard there in the middle is already gone from Maharashtra. We have black buck and wolf in our grasslands, for example. But we are also linked in conservation.
to forestry, agriculture, animal husbandry, fisheries, tribal welfare, uh, food and drug administration, commerce and industry. So all these ministries have an important role to play in protecting biodiversity today. Next, please. So what are then the core functions of the Biodiversity Act? If you look at the core functions of the Biodiversity Act, it comes under the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, but it also comes down to the rural panchayat level and the urban municipalities. So each of these governing bodies have got an institutional mechanism by which they sort of create the functions of the Biodiversity Act. And the first function from these local bodies is to create what is known as a People's Biodiversity Register. This registers all the flora and fauna, both wild as well as, as, well as created by humans, in this document, which then becomes law, virtually law for that local area. And that those species then belong to these people. Now, if a pharmaceutical agency wants to take a, a plant from their village, they have to first take permission for this. This is called access. They have to be given access to that through a negotiation. Once that negotiation is done, the negotiation also states that if they make a product out of this, which they are going to sell, then a certain percentage, it's currently sub 2 3%, must go back to that village. Now, creating this is very difficult. Very often we know where the resource has come from up to the urban area. But how do you get back to that village to give that 2 to 3% back? So mostly this money goes to the State Biodiversity Board, which is, uses that money for looking after biodiversity in the state. The other part of this is the conservation angle. So the Biodiversity Act says that any local biodiversity management authority can create a biodiversity heritage site of its own and decide that this particular part of the forest I want to preserve. Now in India, this has been done from time immemorial in our sacred groves. So those sacred groves can become biodiversity heritage site, which the ministry has to then say yes. So that goes from the state board to the, to the Ministry of Forest in Maharashtra state. It then recommends this and the National Biodiversity Authority also has to accept this. So this is how conservation occurs by implementing the core functions of our Biodiversity Act, which is so special and which is very different from any other country. Next, please. So what can the judiciary do? What can lawyers do? What should lawyers need to understand? The first is if an international say pharmaceutical company wants to take away something from here, it's just a matter of having a plastic bag with a few seeds in it and he is able to get our biodiversity out there for doing biotechnological research and also making new products. So there has to be a way to punish these people who have been able to do this. This is part of the work of the National Biodiversity Authority and the State Biodiversity Board, but it's also a responsibility of each one of us as biodiversity management committees at local level. So this is something which we need to understand. Many times people take access permission by saying, research right? And then once the research has been completed, they sell that research work to a production company which then creates a product which can be in, in lakhs and lakhs of, do, of dollars, right? So we would lose this unless we are able to prevent this from happening. And this is still in its nascent stage. We are still not able to do this very well. We have done it for Neem, we have done it for Basmati rice and so on. But we have very few exam good examples of being able to prevent this. The other thing is that we have a problem. See, we have many, many acts which look at natural resources in many different ways. We have the Wildlife Protection Act, which looks at mainly at wild species. We have the Forest Conservation Act. We have the Forest Rights Act, which gives rights to people for forest products and so on. Now, these don't always fall in consonance with the Biodiversity Act. 
So currently we are doing a lot of research on trying to say, how do we mainstream all these acts which are being able to legislate biodiversity? But we need to punish criminals now for Ill illegal export of biodiversity products and both plants and animals which are going out are going out very surreptitiously. We know, for example, it goes out for food. Like pangolins have gone out to China and has created this huge problem of the virus. So illegal export without permission of the NBA is something that has to be very strictly adhered to and the punishment for this has to be very stringent. But lawyers need to understand this first. So penalizing also local industry for using something which they have not taken excess and they have not compensated the local people who through their traditional knowledge have conserved it for many, many generations. Next, please. So how do we minimize this threat to biodiversity? There are a few very specific things we can do. We have to decide on possible future debates over bioresources now. So there are going to be huge battles over biodiversity in future. Just like we said that one day there could be a war over water, but there could be wars over biodiversity. So we need to prevent its overuse and misuse at the local level. We need to reduce the abiotic parts of it, pollution of air, soil, water, which affects living organisms. We need to prevent the loss of traditional values. I think this is extremely important for India. Sacred groves, ponds, mountains, river belts. We talk about the Ganga, but there are many other rivers which are held sacred. So all this is traditional value and we need to preserve that. Preventing extinction of endangered species through which is happening through habitat loss. So how do we recreate or how do we actually recreate natural ecosystems or as natural as possible. We need to stop planting exotic species which have come from outside. A species like Lantana, which is a shrub, which a, which a British lady had brought in as a garden plant, today has spread over all our forests. And, and much of our shrub biodiversity is lost once this exotic invasive species spreads across the country. We also need to do some things for all the disasters that we have. And one such disaster is the COVID that we are going through today. Okay, next please. So we have to see how we can do all these different activities through people's participation. And therefore, what can we all do as citizens? I think the first thing we have to do is a deeper understanding of what is the biodiversity management committees functions what is the role of the People's Biodiversity Register? How do we create access and benefit sharing for those people who have actually preserved biodiversity? And how do we make these small biodiversity heritage sites? So this is the first part of what each of us needs to understand. The second is supporting public awareness for this. And I must say the television and media have done this very well. I think a very big role has been played by the judiciary in India. The judiciary has been extremely proactive to doing this. And the picture you see there is something that was brought about by this great jurist, this great lawyer called M.C. Mehta. M.C. Mehta, apart from litigating that the Taj should not be destroyed by air pollution from turbine power plants and other industries, brought about a very, very fascinating legislation. He insisted with the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court agreed with him that both the Ministry of Human Resource Development, Education Ministry, as well as the Ministry of Environment and Forest must make efforts to make biodiversity conservation and natural resource management and environmental management a public it put, in, put it to public domain. And he said this must be done through schools, through colleges, through television programs. That those days there was no television actually. It happened through putting slides in cinemas and so on. So much of what we see today as environmental information is something that MC Mehta brought in through a public interest litigation, which the courts took huge action. Now at that time, there was this question of how should the 
uh, university grants commission do this the ncert national council for education research and training was lobbying and doing this through textbooks of schools but we had not done anything at the university college level and therefore the university college level asked us at bharti vidyapeeth to write a textbook for undergraduate students so this was mc mehta's huge huge contribution to conserving biodiversity and environment management across the country so this was advocacy with government which happened at different levels at that point in time in the 1990s and early 2000s and support for publicly available communication education and public awareness really came through television programs which i think have played a huge role in making people aware of the need for conservation but still there is a lack of information on our biodiversity act and how the biodiversity act can lead to sustainable development across our country next please so i have also been asked today to say a few words about covid i think covid has opened our eyes it has made us understand that a small virus in fact earlier than the earliest living forms can paralyze our world completely and and stick us into this huge disaster right and this disaster is not going to go away very soon it's there to, to with us to stay and people have suddenly become aware that there is something that we have to understand about biological diversity and about environment management how we will continue to feel that way that is part of human nature we really don't know how this was this will go and how people will in future respond to this kind of thing so i think with this uh, we have gone through a whole lot of, uh, of of things that we need to understand but we also need to act upon and unless we all together act on this Uh, a lot of species are going to disappear very very rapidly across the world today so thank you very much uh, law college for having invited me for this i hope uh, all you listeners who are listening to this will try to take part in a conservation action programs across the country thank you very much thank you sir thank you very much for uh, this highly enlightening uh, session of sir i must say that this presentation has filled me as well as others with a renewed sense of vigor to protect biodiversity sir uh, we had certain questions regarding uh, certain aspects of uh, biodiversity act and the other related provisions the foremost being sir uh, so what kind of institutional mechanisms will be needed for effective implementation of the access and benefit sharing framework especially when one sees it in context of the media program it's a, that's a very good question I, i i must say that's that's a super question what sort of institutional mechanisms deal with abs today i think we already have a uh, institutional mechanism through the national biodiversity authority the state biodiversity boards and the biodiversity management committees this is exactly what is expected from the act that has been created to do this i must say it is not very strong the abs part has been lagging behind it needs a lot of understanding of the economics of biodiversity it needs a lot of ability to convince people for this and um, i always talk about uh, uh, i always talk about a very interesting one which i saw as abs mechanism for tripura and uh, in tripura there was a, a chairman of dependent on one simple product which they were selling and which was being marketed in the markets of calcutta and that was if you can see this yes sir so yes, this was what they were marketing this is a grass which grows extensively in tripura and many other states and this jhadu grass was being sold was being bought at a very small price from the local villagers who is to go and harvest this and sold quite at quite a price in calcutta 
So what this uh, gentleman did was he told the village biodiversity management committee that why don't you get together and market this? So we were asked to go and assess this. And when I assessed this, I said, yes, it's obvious that the local people are getting some benefit out of actually doing ABS with this. But I want to see what benefit that purchaser has. So that, per that one fellow who was buying all this product was called to the meeting. And uh, I asked him, I said, uh, benefit So he said that in, in the past, I had to go from household to household with a group of my employees to work out the price at each household. Today, I come to the biodiversity management committee and in one go, I'm able to solve this whole problem. And the local biodiversity management committee said, we are able to not only get this, but we are able to support more families out of this. And today people, instead of growing rice, they are growing this broom grass. So this is a simple example of what you can do with this. But please remember, there are big international efforts also. We have done this for Neem. We have done this for Basmati rice. Uh, we are currently doing it for a lot of other products. So by and large, this is going to become the institutional mechanism for doing access and benefit sharing, both at the international and at the national level. So I think that answers your question. But there is one part of this which I always say. This cannot happen without public awareness. So there has to be a feedback which goes back to the biodiversity committees uh, that this will benefit you personally. Yes, sir. so thank you very much, sir. So the second question is, um, sir, you rightfully mentioned in your presentation that uh, the aboriginals hold a special significance in preserving our forest resources since ages. So, but there has been a disturbing trend as being visible by the MOEF, the Ministry of Environment and Forest, giving clearances to coal mining projects and other projects in quick succession. So with such a trend, how do you foresee or what are your suggestions in protecting the rights of the aboriginals, especially with regard to the provisions in the Forest Rights Act and other relevant statutes? Uh, you've asked me two separate questions, actually. <clears throat> One is about this coal mining and uh, whatever mines come about and other, other industrial products as well. Now, this has to be maintained by very strict environmental impact assessments uh, and also in many places where you cannot stop it by good mitigation measures like CAMPA, which, is, uh, which uh, gives you money for afforestation, for example. So this is at that level. But what you ask me for, for tribal communities, it's very important that we are able to supply these tribal communities with enough background to say we want to preserve this biodiversity because it is important economically for us. If we are not able to produce that linkage, we will not be able to do this. So this is a very important thing. And for us, I think this uh, coal mining and so on is that we are going to need more and more coal, but until we get more and more energy out of solar power plants and out of uh, wind energy and so on, which are clean energy sources, we won't be able to do this. But we also have individual ways of doing this. We need to save energy, which will therefore not need coal, by reusing and recycling products, which, are, which take an enormous amount of energy to manufacture. So all of us have a role to play in this. So yes, there are these two very complex questions. Uh, we need to be able to bring them down to the individual level, which means looking at sustainable development goals and saying it's not only the country and the government that has to manage sustainable development, but every individual has a role to play in sustainable development. Yeah? Thank you, sir. Thank you for your response, sir. Uh, so there was one more question. Uh, so the previous past few months have been uh, disturbing, especially in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. But there was one other disturbing news, and that was of the destruction of the Uran wetlands. So how do you assess this destruction and its impact on the avian species? Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, the, this is not only Uran. It's, 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 it's a problem with wetlands across the country, and we have to look at it in that perspective. 
And uh, we need to do several things to understand the wetland values much better. So one is that you need to understand are they being increasingly polluted? What is causing that pollution? And therefore we need to use our pollution control mechanisms much better. But we also need to look at trends. We need to look at the trend, for example, from looking at the pollution level in the water, the chemical pollutants that are there, uh, the waste that goes in there. We can actually use <coughs> indicators such as fish diversity and bird diversity there. And we need to look at what is the level of disturbance that is happening to an ecosystem. This is a broad range of things that need to be done. It's really a very strong environment management uh, policy that we have. We have the policy, we have the acts, but we have low levels of implementation uh, for a variety of reasons. But I think the main reason is that we do not have enough public awareness. We do not participate actively in these kind of measures. And I think that is where we need to change our whole lifestyle in trying to understand both environmental issues as well as biodiversity conservation concerns. Right? You, so, as you know, we are uh, going live on various platforms. So, there was an interesting question which has been brought forth us. Sir, the question is what makes a species disappear? And uh, after plants and animals, will humans be the next to extinct? I think this would. <laughs> This is a very interesting question, especially uh, in this uh, in this pandemic. Okay, <clears throat> what makes uh, species disappear? Uh, I, I think we need to understand this as overuse. being overuse and misuse. So, if we go on using resources, and we are and those resources are in one way linked to the food pyramid, we are going to lose species. And species are lost not individually. When if you lose one species many linked species vanish, right? Or at least they become, their abundance levels begins to fall. And when that happens, at some point, a tipping point is reached for a particular species and it vanishes. So extinction is something which is really, really irreversible. We try to do things like ex situ conservation, which means taking a few of those species. Now we've just now done that for Great Indian Bustard, for example. We have a breeding site for Great Indian Bustard. We have a species like the vulture, which used to be in hundreds in the sky, thousands, right? Suddenly over 20, 25 years, the population dropped by 90, 90, 95%, leaving only a few bustards elsewhere, uh, in especially around protected areas and so on. Now, it took us many years to identify the cause for this. And the cause was that one drug, which was traditionally used in human medicine, which I used to use as a surgeon, called diclofenac, was now being used for veterinary, veterinary doctors. And when the cattle that had in, taken diclofenac died and vultures fed on them, diclofenac was, neuro, uh, was eurotoxic, toxic for the kidneys of vultures, and vultures died in huge numbers. Now, vulture is an important link in the detritus food chain. It cleans up the, uh, up the dead carcasses of cattle, of sheep, of wildlife, which are there. And so the loss of vultures has affected whole ecosystems. So a small event like changing a drug from a human drug to a veterinary drug could lead to the loss of one of the commonest species, bird species in India. So one will never know this, and this is why we need to understand what is called the precautionary principle. We sometimes don't have good scientific evidence to say this species will disappear because of this. We did not know that pangolins or bats could be responsible for COVID, for example. Okay, So because we don't know, we have to very often use a good gut feeling. And that is what the precautionary principle is about. So I think when you say what makes them disappear, it can be a multitude of causes, but very often it's a lack of implementation of legal instruments that we have. So we need to even look at that. How do we implement the best form of conservation? And this is about misuse and overuse. And I think on the 5th of June, somebody has asked me to give a webinar 
on the misuse and overuse or exploitation of species. So you're welcome for that. You asked for the link and Madam, I think we'll have the link with her. So the next thing I have to talk about. So thank you. Sir. Yes, sir. I, I think, uh, I hope it has been an interesting session for all your viewers. And I hope they all begin to act for conservation and for biodiversity management. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your uh, insightful uh, responses to the question, sir. So we shall now move on to the vote of thanks. Uh, sir, it is indeed an honor for me to propose the vote of thanks for today's webinar. At the outset, I would like to remember our founder, Chancellor, sir, Dr. Patang Rao Kadam, sir, because of whose blessings this webinar has been a great success. This event also holds ample importance because 2020 being the review year of the short-term targets of the Aichi biodiversity targets. So there is a saying in Sanskrit, uh, prakriti raksha, rakshati rakshita, meaning nature protects itself if it is protected. So I'm delighted to state that every word of this presentation clearly manifests this point. So once again, on behalf of the environment cell of the new law college of Bharti Vidya Peet Pune, I once again extend my sincere gratitude to you for taking out time and presenting uh, your views on Biodiversity Act and the other dimensions of the said set. Thank you, sir. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.